conference. You will engage and listen to the presentation in the language you select. If your device does, is not supported, such as a Chromebook, at this time, you may download the Zoom app on your phone to access interpretation. Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a este taller uh, sobre um, saber importante información sobre suicidio. Antes de comenzar nuestra sesión, quiero informarles que este, este taller se presentará en inglés y tendrá interpretación simultánea en español. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, deberá hacer clic en el icono de globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y seleccionar el idioma preferido. Participará y escuchará la presentación en el idioma que seleccione. Si su dispositivo no admite interpretación, por ejemplo, como algunos Chromebooks, puede bajar la aplicación Zoom en su teléfono para poder escuchar la interpretación. So I'd like to review some important points uh, that you have to understand before today's presentation. During this webinar, we will have an opportunity to ask questions in the chat. And then our presenter may ask uh, if you have any questions, um, and then we will allow you to turn on your mic. And so without any further delay, I want to turn this, this program over to a wonderful champion for students, Mr. Sagra Segrado from Local District Central. All yours, Mr. Sagrado. Thank you so much and, and good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank all the parents and everybody who's here um, today. Um, we're going to have a conversation um, on a very sensitive but very important topic that I think is important for us to be aware of how do we support our child but also have a better understanding on how do we support students who may be experiencing suicidal ideation or engaging in self-injurious behavior. So we're gonna go over what the objectives of today will be. So one of the things we're gonna do is, is learn about how do we identify uh, if your child is engaging in self-injurious behaviors or is at risk for suicide? And then how do we connect them to the appropriate resources, not only within LAUSD on your campus, but also what are some of those uh, resources that are available in the community. And one of the things I say it's really important for us to be aware of is, is that when, when we are struggling or having challenges with our child um, or our youth is going and making sure that we talk to our campus, um, whether it's an administrator, whether it's a, a counselor, even this child's teacher so that they can connect them to a crisis team member on that campus that can begin to support your child and help support you and and as your child is um, getting the appropriate resources and supports and then we're going to talk about the importance around the, what we call a safety plan that can help reduce the risk of suicide and self-injurious behaviors and we'll talk a little bit about why it's important to develop a safety plan for students who may be engaging in self-injurious behaviors or having um, suicide ideation because that, that plan will help them identify things that they can do and things that the family as well as the school can do to support their child while they're struggling or trying to get um, grounded. And then we're gonna talk about the, how to identify the support that your child may be needing mental health services um, or the social emotional uh, needs of your child while using psychological first aid. And those are things that we as parents can do um, in supporting our child. And there's going to be a handout um, that that we have that can help support that understanding um, around the things we as parents can do. And it's the listen, connect, protect, model, and teach. And we'll go over those um, in the presentation. Again, I know this is a, it can be a sensitive and difficult topic. Um, I know it can be based on our own personal experience with the issue of depression or suicide, um, whether in our own personal families or lives or experiences. So again, my intention isn't to trigger anyone, but it's to make sure that we're having a conversation that's important for us to have um, as we support our students, our families, and our, and our communities. With that, we're going to sh show a quick video. And then if you want, if you have any comments or any um, takeaways from that video, I would encourage you to put that in the chat. My son was successful and had friends, but during his junior year, he started to withdraw from everything 
he eventually attempted suicide. We were shocked. Our daughter came to us very upset and anxious. She said she had no future and she wanted to die. We were able to talk it through that day and she was okay. My niece struggled with depression and in her freshman year, she lost 25 pounds in a month. She got some help and we later learned she had been thinking of suicide. I'm so glad they helped her. After a suicide on his team, my son was confused, sad and angry, but he didn't want to talk about it. When we did talk about it, he admitted that the whole team was struggling. I'm happy we were able to be there. These are the voices of people who have been impacted by suicidal thoughts or behaviors in a young person in their lives. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people between 10 and 24. It is one of the most challenging and frightening topics to talk about for a family. It's also more important to talk about than anything else. Keep a few important things in mind. Suicidal thoughts are common. If a young person experiences suicidal thoughts, he or she can feel scared and too ashamed to talk about them. While thoughts are always a concern and can be warning signs, suicidal behavior is far more dangerous. When young people find out that suicidal thoughts are common, they often feel relieved to know that they aren't alone and they aren't going crazy. Suicidal thoughts are usually temporary. Most people with thoughts of suicide only experience them for a short time before they pass. Even if they return, young people can learn to cope with temporary distress and manage their thoughts and discomfort. When youth can cope with and manage bad news, bad moods, difficult social interactions, or simply the awkward task of growing up, they tend to think of suicide far less frequently. It's okay to talk about suicide. Asking a young person, are you thinking of killing yourself with a calm, confident tone sends a very important message. It conveys that it's okay to talk about anything. It can provide hope and relief to a young person who is feeling hopeless. Treatment works. Youth can experience relief and a reduced risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Sometimes the thoughts and behaviors are temporary and creating a safety or crisis response plan has been shown to be effective during a hard time. If the thoughts continue or get worse, Evidence-based treatments to prevent suicide are reliable ways to address the most dangerous conditions. Resources are available. From immediate crisis services to long-term treatment, youth and families can find many different helpful resources. Counselors and medical providers are able to help treat those who struggle with thoughts of suicide. Community and school prevention programs offer education and support to families. Emergency rooms, 911 operators, and first responders are well trained in crisis management. And there are many 24 hour crisis lines available to help young people experiencing suicidal thoughts or families in need of help. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available by phone, text, chat, Facebook, and Twitter, among others. Youth who struggle with suicidal thoughts or behavior can feel scared, sad, and ashamed. Families will be concerned and want to help. Starting the conversation is the most important first step. Families should know that they have the power to change things for the young people they love. Sometimes that all important question and the help that can come from it can save a young life. So I don't, I don't know if there are any questions, any takeaways from the, the video. If, if I don't know if, uh, uh, Javier or Alex, if there's anything on the chat that uh, we may want to address. But one of the things I think is important is if you looked at that video, is we, we, it's important to know that when we talk about suicide, that although it may be a very difficult subject to talk about, it's an important topic that we need to have with, with our child uh, if, if we're concerned about that. Because one of the things when it comes to the issue around suicide, just asking the question, um, are they thinking of, of killing themselves? If that's something that they are thinking about, what happens, it actually provides them some relief because they no longer have to hold it for themselves. 
And so I think one of the things that's important is, is having those tough and difficult conversations can be useful. Um, Gustavo. Yes. Um, one, we don't have any questions in, in, in the chat, but one, one thing that I um, took from the video was the I, um, idea that um, having these thoughts are, it's actually uh, common uh, um, amongst uh, our students. And that I, I was unaware of that. And that, um, it's, it's good to know, uh, and it's good to, uh, to share that information. We come uh, in contact with some, someone that might be ha having these thoughts. And I'm thinking about my own kids myself. Right. Uh, um, and, regarding that. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that's important to understand that, again, we have to just take things in perspective of what the last two and a half years have looked like for a lot of our families that have that had gone through a lot of challenges, losses, and then as a result of it, the complexities already prior to the pandemic, there's been a lot of families that have been in, in crisis. And, and part of it, I think, is important to understand is, is although it is common to have these thoughts, and, and they mentioned thoughts aren't necessarily relate to behavior. Thoughts are just that. Thoughts do not hurt us. It's the behaviors that when they begin to engage in it, where then that's where it becomes even more serious. Although we do want to take things serious when they start talking about it, it's just that we want to get to the point to prevent them from acting those things out because thoughts don't hurt us. It's the behaviors that do. And I think that's part of where I think as families, we have to be mindful of. And so what we're going to do is just talk about what some of those warning signs are. And when we talk about warning signs, it's important to understand those are the observable things that we can see. Um, um, in a child or an individual that may have suicide, idea, suicide ideation, whether it's making um, suicidal threats, whether direct or indirect. And what we mean about indirect is, is, is those children who say, I wish I was never born. Why, why am I even here? Compared to what, what a direct threat is, is when a child or an individual says, I want to kill myself. Both of them are things that we need to take serious. It's just understanding that some of them tend to be passive. We tend to see student, individuals that have negative uh, view of self, tend to be very pessimistic, tend to isolate uh, from people, feeling alone. Um, all of those things are important to know when we talk about those warning signs. Those are things that we can begin to see in somebody. Engaging in risky behaviors is one of those as well. And again, we're not talking about just in general uh, normal adolescents where sometimes some of our youth because they may not understand you know the certain consequences of certain things because you know when you're a young you think nothing's going to hurt you and that you're invincible and we're not talking about that we're talking about when they're engaging in things that could potentially put them at risk you know when we talk about students who self-medicate engage in drug use um, as a way of coping can potentially put them at risk and you know unfortunately you know we've seen um, students who who get injured or die as a result of, of that as well. Uh, one of the major ones that I think is important for us to know is those drastic changes in mood and behavior. If your child is happy and you see a dramatic change in that child where they're no longer engaged in things that they used to do, no longer find purpose in their lives, no longer you know are engaged in the, the things that were helpful or meaningful to them, um, that's when you want to make sure that you start having those conversations about, hey, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on. And understanding at the same time with some of our youth, especially with some of our young men, we are told not to show our emotions sometimes, um, whether from our own families, from the community, and just in general society, um, where we're told it's, it's better to be tough and show that aggressivity. So for some youth, especially for some of our young men, it's... Um, they'll show it in the sense of being angry rather than say, I'm sad. But it, it's important to understand that behavior is language. And again, is what is that language saying to us? When we talk about then the risk factors, these are all things that um, can in itself increase the likelihood of, of, of a student engaging in self-injurious behavior or having suicide ideation. But it's important to understand there's not just one thing that tends to predict um, uh, somebody who may be in engaging in those things. Sometimes we tend to hear that, you know, it's because of someone being bullied. Um, and it's not, can it be because of that? Sometimes it can be, but it isn't always that. It's always sometimes a bunch of other things that are going on in a child's life that puts them in a crisis. Again, whether or not they've had previous 
suicide or uh, a, a suicidal attempts or engage in self injurious behaviors, relationship problems, especially for the students who begin to kind of find their place in the world and find somebody they connect with and then that relationship no longer uh, uh, is sustainable to them, you know, they kind of see it as being the end of their their whole experience and don't see that, you know, they all at some point uh, find somebody else and engage in in a healthy relationship with those people. If they themselves um, have an underlying mental health condition that has either been unidentified or hasn't been treated um, adequately, that can actually be a, one of those risk factors as well. If we've lost a family member um, or somebody close to us through, through suicide, that can actually increase the those um, those type of thoughts and behaviors. But I will tell you, access or uh, to harmful means is one of those that's important for us to uh, be mindful of. If our child is telling us that they're gonna, they want to die, and they're telling us how they're gonna do it, it's important that first we're doing was removing things from the home that can potentially put them at risk for those things. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the safety plan. So when we talk about self injurious behavior, it's important to understand that it's different from suicide in, in the sense that it's a way in how individuals use to manage and, and cope with their stress. I'll bet it's, it's an, an unhealthy way of doing it. It's important to understand their intention isn't necessarily to die. It's a way of coping with things that are coping. So it's an in, intentional injury that they do to themselves. It's also important to know that it, it for some individuals, they tend to do it with friends. It tends to be a way for them to bond with other people. It's sometimes they, they trauma bond. Uh, and, and it's important to understand that if your child is engaged in, in self-injurious behaviors, it's important to find out who their friends are and let the school know who those individuals are because they may also need some help as well. And like I mentioned earlier, there's no really big difference between um, our genders when it comes to the uh, the engage in self injurious behavior is just it's going to manifest itself different because of the way how we're socialized and there is no difference between any age or social economic um, um, populations. The only thing, as I say, is that some of our students or individuals who live in more affluent neighborhoods um, tend to have a little bit more resources, not only in, in internally but also externally, in, in getting some of that support. Um, and I think so when we're talking about self injury, we're talking about those unexplained bruises, scars, cuts, burns, things that they tend to do to engage in um, having control of their own emotions. I'll tell you, in my own personal experience of working with students, I didn't have a single student who ever told me that when they would cut that it actually hurt. They would tell me the opposite, that it actually made them feel better. And I know sometimes as, as adults, uh, we can't have trouble understanding that, but it's important to understand it because of when they engage in self injurious behaviors, there tends to be some release of endorphins in the brain, where it actually makes them feel a little better, better as a result of, of what they're doing. And again, one of the things I always tell parents is, or individuals is, is that if you're going to tell your child to not engage in self injurious behaviors, or, or not to have these thoughts, or behaviors around suicide idea, uh, suicide, it's important that we're replacing it with something because whether, if we don't give them something to replace it with, what happens is they may engage in more harmful means. And, and you know, when we talk about uh, inappropriate clothing, we're not talking about the students who engage um, in um, expression or self-expression around um, their clothing. We're talking about the students who don't go on and dress for PE because they don't want to show those cuts, the ones who tend to cover themselves up because they have scars. One, sometimes it can be shame. They may have sometimes uh, shame around what they're doing, but they also don't want people um, to engage in, the, in, in conversation with them at times. And although for us, it's important to understand that it, it may be a secret behavior or we as adults may not know it, the reality is that students are communicating those things. They're communicating that those things through their friends. And then more importantly, is they're communicating those things via social media. The reality is, is our, our youth nowadays, their primary mode of communicating is through their cell phones, um, through the different uh, social media sites that they have, whether it's their TikTok, Instagram, uh, Facebook, um, or all their various other um, uh, apps that they may have. And it's important to understand that 
if they are doing it that way, there's a, a, a risk to communicating those things via social media and not communicating that to the people in their lives directly. It is unfortunately, we tend to have individuals who are trolls, people who will see that a child is in crisis and will actually trigger them into going on and engaging in more uh, harmful means. I've had those situations where parents would say, or students would tell me that they posted something when they were vulnerable. And as a result of it, um, someone would say is, well, why don't you do it? Or, you know, um, you, you know, you deserve it type thing. And then that person goes into crisis. And if they're not in a good space, um, it can literally push somebody into engaging into more harmful means um, or engage in uh, um, attempting. And so as parents, I think it's important for us to be aware of, of, of what our, our child is communicating or how they're communicating those things. If we have um, phones that we're giving them or they have the technology is we need to have a conversation with them about allowing us to be a part of that life. We as parents cannot be isolated and not engaged in that part of their lives because it's a large part of their life. Um, and it's and I know sometimes we may not know how to go on and 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 access those um, apps on the computers, but go to the campuses, go to your uh, um, older children or other family members who know how to use those things, who know how to be tech savvy and, and help you with that process, but have those conversations with your child um, because you don't want them to be able to have a space in this world where you as a parent have no influence or at least have no access to. So it is important that the moment we become aware of that, that we're looking for support, that we're accessing or finding the support for our child and letting them know that. Uh, because sometimes again, is uh, when a child is in crisis, they may feel more isolated and may not know that people are trying to help them because the way and how they're perceiving the world at that moment may be so negative for them that they may say, well, no one really cares. Um, and I know as parents, one of the hardest part is to, to think that your child may be engaging in behaviors that can not only be harmful, but engage in behaviors that could potentially put their lives at risk. So again, so if they're communicating those things, if they're expressing how they'll do um, Aaron, it, something to hurt themselves or to kill themselves, it's important that we're reacting and in a calm and in a caring way. If they're telling us or we find out that they're in, in the past have engaged in some of those things, it's not by sh shaming them or blaming them as to why they never came to us. It's saying, what am I going to do now moving forward as a parent to support my child? Because these are the major uh, common responses. You know, yeah, are we going to be panicked by it? Of course. I mean, it's it's an overwhelming uh, feeling to have that your child um, is engaging in self-injurious behaviors or is thinking of killing themselves. Um, are we going to be worried? By all means, we're going to be worried. Um, are we sometimes going to be helpless in saying that I can't help my child or I know, don't know how to help my child? Yes, it's going to happen, but it's important to be mindful that we let them know that we care, that we love them, um, that they have a right to their feelings, uh, how difficult as those feelings may be. But what they don't have a right to do is to take it out on themselves or take it out on other people because it's not fair to the people who care and love them. I will tell you, these needs two feelings uh, or emotions tend to be the emotions that potentially can put a child further into crisis. If we as parents, the first response is to be angry at them as to why did you do this? And why didn't you tell me? And, and, and that is the response for, that we give our child rather than I'm concerned, please let me help you. What potentially you're doing is, is you're, you're closing that conversation with your child and they may no longer be able to or willing to come and talk to you as a parent. Um, and sometimes that discuss. I've had parents who would say is uh, when I would uh, when I was with school based PSW, where parents would say is is like, why would you do that? Don't you know that is so ugly? And look what you're doing to your body. And just we're shaming a child into what they're doing again. And I know it's difficult um, if those things are happening. But if we're giving them the message that it's uh, that as a result of it, that they should feel less than. Sometimes kids will at that point shut down and no longer want to talk to us. Again, one of the things I always say that two things that is um, kids would always tell me why they wouldn't tell their parents. The first thing is because they didn't, their parents would get angry at them. The second one is, is that their parents would worry. 
And I'd say is we as parents are always going to react in a certain way. And we have a feeling we have those right to those feelings. Again, it's just being mindful of not expressing certain feelings that can potentially put them at higher risk or trigger them into not feeling that support around them. And again, that's sometimes difficult. Does that mean that we have to have conversations as a family outside of the house where our child isn't hearing? Yes. Sometimes there's going to be decisions that need to be made um, as a family uh, within the adults of how do you keep your child safe? And you don't want to uh, have that conversation in, initially in front of your child as you're working those things out, whether it's with other adult members in the family, whether it's your spouse or partner, whatever that may look like, it's important to first figure out how you're going to have a common uh, language, a common message that you're going to give your child around how you're going to keep them, the one, safe, but also, two, how they're going to get support. So these are some of the documents that uh, that are important to to be aware of. And, and within LAUSD, we have the suicide prevention awareness for parents. And this is where they go over the risk factors, warning signs that I just discussed. But they also go over what they call a psychological first aid is, is that when we talk about listening, um, we're talking about not only listening to what our kids are saying to us, but also what they're not saying to us. You know, I am one of those I can uh, that I always tell parents is I can tell you what's going on in the life of an of a, an elementary school child by the way in how they play, because that's their language, that's their way of, of communicating. Same thing with middle school and high school students is, you know, their behavior will tell us a lot about what they're saying. So when we listen, it's important that we're listening not only with our ears, but our eyes, but also with our hearts is being aware that sometimes, although it's difficult, and our primary or initial response may be a certain way is we got to ask ourselves is what I'm going to say at this point or what I'm going to do is that going to bring my child closer to me or potentially going to isolate them from me um, when we talk about protecting not only are we talking about protecting by removing um, access to those means whether it's medications whether it's um, over the counter as well as prescribed, whether it's blades, um, knives, if there's a weapon in the house, making sure that we're removing them from the house, but also making sure that they are aware of how they're um, communicating things online, being aware of, again, who it is that they're communicating things with, connecting them, not only connecting them to people at home or in the community uh, for support, but also at school. Um, I like to always talk about a circle of carers. Who are those three to five caring adults in your child's life at school? And who are those three to five caring adults at home or in the community who are going to support you as a parent? Not in the absence of you. It's parent, it, people who you have trust in, who you know will communicate those things back to you. And again, it isn't that you're not giving your child an opportunity to have a, a space to talk about things with other people. But it, when it comes to the issue of safety, is, is those are the people who, if a conversation of safety is needs to be brought to your attention, that it's brought to your attention and it isn't kept away from you. And then we talk about modeling is making sure that we're calm and that we're establishing a safe environment in the house again by removing things, but also giving them the opportunity to have or understand that they have control or, or need to have managed uh, their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Because that's the only thing that we really have control over. We don't have control over who we, uh, where we live, well, the school we go to at times, who our parents are, or the things that happen to us. But we have control over how we think about those things, how we react to those things, um, and, and, and how we feel about those things. So it's important to be mindful of those things. And when we talk about teaching is letting them know um, that there's ways in how they can manage with their those feelings. Again, when we talk about um, the issue around managing their stress, their anger, their sadness, is finding things that they can do to help support that process, whether it's mindfulness practices, whether it's deep breathing techniques, whether it's, you know, the uh, box breathing, you know, uh, deep breathing, counting backwards to 10, depending on what the age is of your child is finding something that's going to work for them and helping them understand how they can do those things to help them manage those stress. Uh, the, as they kind of navigate through things, because something that they may be useful for them at school may not necessarily be um, useful for them in other areas of their lives. And again, so those are the things you want to be mindful of. So again, these are just the documents that I'm, I discussed. Um, and again, 
these are the ones for the suicide one. And then they have the ones for self-injury, both in English and in Spanish. Um, and it's important for you to be mindful or aware of what those resources are, because it also provides also hotline numbers, um, as well as what are some of our clinics within the district are to help support your child. And again, at any point, you can always go and talk to your school uh, or where your child's at and ask for a referral for counseling services, and they can help with that referral. One of the things I think is important as a result of understanding when somebody's in crisis or going through certain things, they have the ability to bounce back. And when we talk about resiliency, it's that ability to bounce back from and or depth from things that happen in our lives. So we have that ability to learn from some of those things that we've done, whether it's healthy or not. Um, when we look at things in life about problem solving, is not only just helping your child understand that if they made a mistake, Again, not shaming them or blaming them, but asking them how is it that they came to that conclusion and then asking them if there are other things that they could have done. Because we want them to understand that they have the ability to learn from those experiences and have a takeaway from that. So it's also understanding that they have the ability to learn um, their own feelings and, and acknowledge what that looks like, but also with other people as well. And being aware of that you don't avoid problems is that you confront them and you get people to help you manage those things that will be important for you. Because one thing is, is, is we have to understand that resiliency can be built. It's something that we can um, build upon. And every year a child gets older, they learn new experiences, they had get new uh, information that helps them be healthier um, or have different ways of navigating through the world. And so it's important to understand that if we can change the experience for a child, we can change the way in how the brain functions or is wired. And that's one of the things that is important to understand that it's, it's, it's not rigid or, or, or fixed that, but that the, the brain is malleable and it learns and it grows. Um, so it's important to understand that it, it helps with regards to our resiliency, how our, our child, um, when it comes to the impact of trauma, or struggles in their child's life because they learn certain things at an early age or as they go through life. And those are things that they can apply uh, moving forward because are your child is your child gonna struggle with challenges in their lives? By all means they are. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect life or perfect family. There's always gonna be challenges. It's just what's what are we gonna learn from that ex example? You know, in, in LAUSD, we call that is is that growth mindset. What is my takeaway from it? When we talk about um having or learning the experiences you know from things in our lives it's that self-efficacy it's things that we can go on and do um to have greater control over our own um lives um and being aware of the things that we have no control over and again the last two years we can literally have those conversations about the things that we as families or even as individuals thought we had control over when we didn't the moment things shut down on us uh, when the schools closed, works closed, you know, it, it was a scary time. And again, it was a, it's a good opportunity to use all of those experiences to help build our growth mindset, but also our self-efficacy. Because we've, we've gotten through it. I mean, we may have gotten through it battered and bruised, but we're getting through it and we're still going to get through it. And it's important to understand is, as a family or as a community, what we're going to do to to come out um, greater or in a greater position um, as a result of those things. So again, what do we do is you want to re um, react immediately. It's important that we let them know that we're concerned. It's important that we go on and protect our child, uh, their child, their safety, making sure we're removing those things. And if we need to talk to somebody, like I said, not only on your campus, you can also call the Department of, uh, of Mental Health. Um, and they have that number, the 1-800-854-7771. And that number, you can always have somebody who you can talk to and can provide you resources in the community, but also kind of help if your child needs to be assessed or if somebody needs to be assessed. If your child is in crisis, um, the suicide hotline number and has a new number. It's a 988. Um, it's an easier number to remember, and it's pretty much just a lifeline. If somebody's in crisis, needs to talk to somebody, and they don't have access to their, their circle of care at that moment, they can call in some professionally trained individual can help them navigate things and, and get them the support and um, let them know that they're not alone.
So when we talk about the safe, uh, safety plan, um, it's important to, again, we talked about with the warning signs, recognizing them. Although sometimes it's hard to see them uh, or think that our child may um, be experiencing those things is the moment we see it is being aware of them. Second is, is understanding the coping strategies. What are they gonna do to manage their, their crisis? What are they gonna do when they're in that dark space? And then the social contacts is that social circle of care that I talked about. Then being uh, the professional contact is who are the professional that are gonna support my child, where it's my primary care physician, whether it's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whether it's a crisis team member on a campus, um, those are the, the professional contacts. And then the means restriction is when we're talking about is removing access to those things that can be potentially harmful or deadly to our child. So again, being aware of thoughts, images, thinking styles, their mood and behavior. Again, we as parents know when our child is happy. We know when our child is sad. Um, and it's just letting them know, I hear you, I see you. And, and that can potentially open up a, com a door for a conversation with your child. When we talk about, again, the identifying the coping strategies, not only are we identifying the coping strategies, but seeing whether or not they're useful. One of the things is when I help with safety plans at times is I always tell parents is if your child says that they're going to listen to music as a coping strategy, is being aware that that coping strategy may not be useful if they're in a classroom because they may not be able to have access to music while they're um, in the class. So what's an alternative? What, the, what can they do? Again, the deep breathing, box breathing, uh, mindfulness practices, all of those are things that they can potentially do in the classroom where they're not gonna disrupt the instruction or disrupt other students. Uh, but problem solve with them. It's letting them know, okay, you can use this here at school. These are the things you can use at home. And these are things that you may not be able to use at certain times. What can you do in, in its place? And then when we talk about just, again, the social context, that circle of care, three to five caring adults in your child's life at school, as well as three to five caring adults at home, in addition to you, not in your absence as a parent. And then helping them know that those people are going to be there to support them, that are going to be able to help them kind of just talk things out, uh, but also making sure that those people also hand that child back to you as a parent and saying, okay, these are the concerns I want you to know, so see how we can best support you. Um, it's a way of, of distraction. When you have a child who's deep in thought in a dark space, if all they're doing is thinking about that and they don't find, you know, uh, ways to manage that, whatever that feeling is, that's all they're going to feel. And so being able to talk to somebody can help them and remind them there's other things they can do in the absence of of things that they have available to them. So it helps them problem solve. And again, it should be people who are close to your child, who your child's comfortable with, and that you're okay with your child talking to. Um, and then it, you wanna at times share that safety plan with the person that your child has chosen, whether it's a grandparent, whether it's an uncle. Um, and it's important to, if they are gonna use a, a sibling that it should be an adult sibling and not a minor. Because again, is we don't want to put a responsibility on to another sibling or another student um, about how to keep their 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 brother or, or friend safe, although they can support, but we don't want them to be that primary person to do so. So when we talk about again that professional help, again, I mentioned that the the national suicide hotline number has changed to 988. Um, they still are using or able to use the numbers that are there. And, and in Spanish is the Red Nacional, um, the Prevención de Suicidio. Um, that number is available as well, but again, they can always call 988 and those numbers are available for parents to use. Again, it's to help them identify that support and how to access it. You know, one of the strongest um, gifts that we have is the strength of knowing that we can ask for help sometimes, especially if we're not using or able to use that often or not used to doing those things. Um, again, if your child is in treatment, it's important that the therapist is aware of those things because they can also help either increase sometimes the time that they see your child and maybe at times have to make a referral for a psychiatrist if and uh, medication is necessary. One of the things, again, that is important to understand that those conversations should be had with the professional um, psychiatrists and psychologists 
around the issue of if medication is important and if your child is then prescribed medication, that those conversations around how to ensure medication compliance is happening um, is done. You don't want to just take your child off the medication because you see that he's maybe falling asleep or that you know he's changed in the mood. Those conversations should be had with the doctor to see whether or not they need to modify the medication or find a different medication for them. And again, when we talk about means restriction, is, is making sure that we're ensuring that anything that can be harmful to our child, weapons, blades, medications, uh, cleaning solutions, uh, that our child doesn't have access to them. Again, you know, one of the things is, is we have to ensure that as in the, in the house, that someone wants to be mindful of, uh, as a parent, who's going to go on and ensure where the blades are at. Uh, if we do have medication that our child doesn't have access to them, that we have them in a secured place in the house. So making sure that those are not accessible to a child. The same thing like when you have a baby, they tell us that, you know, you, you have to have baby proof things. Well, sometimes we also have to safety proof our house um, in that sense. And if we look at it in that sense, we're all, when we have a child, the first thing we do is we make sure that we put things where they can't open the doors, uh, you know, or or open cabinets or making sure that they don't bump their heads type thing. Same thing with our, our child if they're in crisis. And there may be conversations that need to be had around how do we access our child in the house um, to make sure that they are not able to, at times if they're in crisis, able to lock themselves in a, in a place that they can potentially be doing harm to themselves. And again, that's for some of the, where it's ongoing pervasive um, behaviors where there's concern that sometimes we have to have those conversations about how do we have access to our child. And then when we talk about it, uh, the safety plan is we have to talk about how do we increase the motivation in our child is ask them how, what were the things that are useful in that safety plan? How do we help them identify the things that are gonna be useful for them? Because if we as adults give them the answers, the safety plan no longer becomes theirs, it becomes ours. So it's ensuring that the child or youth give us some ideas of things that are gonna be useful for them. And then we as parents can give um, also suggestions. And then we go on and ensure that we review it with our child or our youth um, and letting them know how we're gonna support them through that process. If we have a physical copy of a, a safety plan or if it's a conversation, is letting them know how they can access it. Sometimes it's good to have a piece of paper even though everything's digital um, about how they can access it. And there's different apps on the phone that you can actually look at that have safety plans. And it goes over the same things is, what are my coping strategies? What are the adults uh, in my life who are gonna support me? What are the numbers in my uh, life or the, those people who, how I can access them? And we're gonna go over what they look like right now. Um, so in LAUSD for elementary school age, or sometimes even for middle school, we use this uh, this um, safety plan. It goes over what are my triggers? So things that make me upset, feel bad, or think about dying. And we can talk about what those things are and helping our child identify those things. How are they feeling? And then, you know, we do uh, colorful emojis for the smaller kids. But we also talk about what are the warning signs? What is my body going through? And our kids are very uh, insightful of what's going on with their bodies when they're in crisis, whether the body's tense up, whether they have those racing thoughts. Um, those are things that help them understand, hey, you know what, maybe I need to access my, my safety plan or maybe I need to talk to somebody. Um, they go over who are the, what are their coping strategies, whether it's deep breathing, playing with their pads, exercise, um, drawing, listening to music, whatever that may look like is allowing them to come up with strategies and alternatives. And like I mentioned earlier, in places where they may not have access to that. Um, and then that support at school, who are the staff on campus who are going to support your child? And then also who is, are the supports at home? And then things that we can do to help them. If our child says that they get upset and angry because they feel we're, we're yelling at them, then maybe we need to be mindful of how we're communicating with them. Because again, it's not necessarily that we may be yelling at them, but that's their perception and we have to be mindful of it. Um, because they, again, we don't wanna push them away, we want them closer to us, especially when they're in crisis. And then again, lastly in that safety plan, they go over 
giving you guys hotlines, but also letting you know that you can also um, allow the school to share um, the safety plan or the adult gatekeeper with the identified supports on campus. Typically, it tends to be crisis team members, whether it's a PSA, PSW, school psychologist, um, uh, academic counselor, an AP or a principal, whoever it may be. And again, those are typically you need some of the crisis team members. Um, it allows us to be able to share that with those people to, so that they can support your child. And for high school, middle school and high school, um, this is that document. And again, it doesn't have the emojis. It doesn't it as colorful, but it's it's useful because it allows, again, the child to have something um, to begin that conversation on what they could do to keep themselves safe. So again, that same thing, this is that document. Just lastly, I just wanna mention the importance around self-care, you know, taking care of a child who's in crisis emotionally is draining. It's important that it will tax us physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, but it is important to know that you're not alone. It's important to know that if you are with your child in crisis, the best thing you can do is let him know that you care, that you're worried, but that you're going to help them and that you'll figure it out. Um, you want them to know that they don't have to struggle alone. Um, and again, although we physically came out of a pandemic where we were isolated, some of us, some of our families are still isolated as a result of it. We, those connections we had before were never reestablished. And so reestablish those connections, but let's establish our connections to ourselves first, because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of anyone else. Um, and then these are just the resources that are available. And again, always talk to your primary care physician. Make sure you start the annual checkups again. You know, one of the things for me is I realized that when we were in this lockdown, I hadn't seen my, my doctor in a year and a half. And I was one of those that would literally go twice a year to see my doctor. So now I have to remind myself to get back into that routine. Do the same for yourself and for your child. Again, the, the LAUSD has the student family wellness hotline. Um, it's available from eight to 4.30. And that's the number right there in front of you. And it's option two to talk to somebody in school mental health. For those who have children who are zero to eight, we also have the early childhood mental health consultation line. They can help support you as well. And again, that's eight to 4.30. I mentioned Department of Mental Health, the access number that's available, as well as they have what they call the alley warm line. And that one is available from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. In, in the morning. And I mentioned earlier, the National Suicide Hotline number is still the same, but you can also call 988. I know it was a lot of information. Um, I will say is as families, it's important that when we have concerns, that we don't hold it, um, that we look for help, um, although it may be challenging, it may be difficult, um, again, is with that support and that care for your child and for you, um, you'll be able to get through it. Uh, you know, one of the things I think is as difficult is, is when we shut down um, and don't look for that help is sometimes um, it becomes more challenging in how to support our child, especially when we ourselves are struggling. And again, if you talk to people in your lives, your own circle of care, make sure that there are adults in your lives that you don't your child is not part of your uh, circle of care where if you have frustrations, angers that you're um, com uh, communicating that to your child because then you parentify your child and then they start to feel responsible to keeping you safe or healthy when we want them to take them themselves um, and their health first. Um, Alex? Um, Gustavo, do you mind yes, going back to the previous slide? Uh, parents, I know this is a lot of information. Uh, um, please take this opportunity to take a screenshot uh, uh, of the slide so you can have the information available. Uh, in addition to that, I have dropped links in the chat for uh, the suicide prevention packet that was referenced earlier, uh, um, the suicide uh, parent prevention packet that was referenced earlier uh, in the workshop. So I wanted to make you aware that that link is available in the chat as well as the link to where this recording will be housed uh, at Local District Central's YouTube channel. So uh, that re the recording will be made available by the end of next week. So that link is also in the chat. 
Uh, Alex, I also uh, wanted to say, um, first of all, thank you to Mr. Sagredo. I know I called him Mr. Sagrado at the beginning. I'm going to have him change his name pretty soon because every time he's with us, I call him Mr. Sagrado instead of Mr. Segredo. I do appreciate, uh, Mr. Sagredo, that you mentioned self-care for adults as well, because there's sometimes that, and, and, and keeping our children uh, as, uh, as, as keepers for us as well, um, that that creates a very healthy relationship going back and forth and giving uh, the kids a little bit of a responsibility of knowing that it's a family and we, and we work together and we take care of, not only do we take care of them, but they've got to keep an eye on us every once in a while. We're, we're, we're not super humans and we're vulnerable as well. So thank you for sharing that, um, that we also need to do some self-care and take care of ourselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Contreras. And yes, thank you very much, Mr. Sagredo, uh, for all this wonderful information. And uh, um, do you mind, we do have a question from a, a parent. Do you mind taking a question? Sure. Uh, we had a question from, I believe her name was uh, Sa Sauda. Uh, and I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry. She had her hand raised. Would you like to ask your question now? Is she still in? Okay, I think maybe uh, um, she is no longer here. Okay, um, well now is is the time for uh, questions. If we do have any questions from anybody out there, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or uh, feel free uh, to just unmute yourself and ask your question. And there is a question in the chat. Is oh. there a link for the Younger Children's Safety Plan, uh, meaning zero to eight? Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Contreras. I did not see that. So, uh, so I don't know if it's possible if there's a way for us to if I could forward it to you, Alex. Do you have um, it right now? Um, I would have to look for it. If uh, as you go through the other things, I let me get it and I can put it in there. Okay, got you, got you. No, no problem. All right. So we're going to uh, um, get that link for you. Uh, what we're going to do right now is is we're going to go to um, the the next slide. And we're going to be talking about uh, opportunities uh, to engage uh, parents. Thank you very much for joining uh, um, us today. Uh, we always appreciate you coming to, to our workshops. Uh, we will continue to have workshops uh, uh, that will talk about the important topics that relate to you and your, uh, your families uh, here at Local District Central. And I wanted to let you uh, know and be aware that we do have family academies here at Local District Central. And those family academies are uh, um, most Monday and Wednesday uh, evenings, and this is where you can find them. Please uh, take this opportunity to uh, um, take a screenshot uh, so you can join us for the uh, Family Academies on Monday and Wednesday evenings. Um, also right now, parents, uh, we are in the time of forming our SSCs and our um, ELAC uh, uh, committees at our school sites. So if you want to be involved in your child's uh, school, and give it an idea as what's going on on your child's campus, please reach out to your school and ask about when can you join the parent uh, a meeting uh, for your school site council or for your English Learner Advisory Committee. Uh, if the school has already joined, then ask when is the next meeting. And those are going on right now. And we uh, want as many parents as we can uh, to attend these meetings. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry. Sorry, hold on. So parents, uh, next Thursday, uh, we have our LCAP, uh, which is a uh, session two of our LCAP. We had a wonderful uh, a turnout uh, earlier in the month for the LCAP for the first session. And we're uh, inviting all parents to return for the second session. And making you aware that the LCAP session two is uh, Thursday, September 29th from 9.30 to 11.30. So we hope to see you there. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm trying to find, I need to apologize. Um, hello, hi, oh. good, good morning, uh, Alex. Yes. 
do you think we can probably get the, the participants uh, contact information and then we can email them the different links if they like to leave their emails? Uh, excellent idea, um, Ms. Monson. So we're working on getting that information to you, uh, um, but please, uh, uh, Ms. Monson came up with a great idea. Uh, please put your email in the chat and then we'll be able to send it out, out to you uh, if we are unable to get it on in the chat. So please, again, put your email in, in the chat. Uh, we know that you uh, had asked about the packet for uh, a zero to eight year olds. So please put your email in the chat. Okay, and we have from, um, uh, uh, I think she uh, is a PSW. Uh, she said, try this link to see if it works. Javier, can you try the link? It works, Misha. Alex. I checked. Thank you very much, yeah. LB. Okay. Yeah, it so, does work. So we uh, um, were able to get the link in the chat. So the link link is right right here. It, uh, the link from Misha, uh, Misha, uh, Misha Pink uh, to everyone. I believe she is a PSW uh, within LA Unified, and she dropped the link. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, let me put the Spanish uh, one as well. If you don't mind, I actually. Yes, go ahead. It, it took me a while to find it, so I do apologize. So everyone, this is our um, our information slide uh, for the uh, PACE uh, Parent Educated Coaches, Coaches for LD Central. Uh, um, we have a lot of support here in LD Central. Uh, we have several PACE coaches on with us today. Uh, Mr. Javier Contreras, and he uh, represents uh, downtown MacArthur Park a Community a School. We also have Ms. Velma Monson. Uh, she represents uh, Manual Arts Community a School. We have... Um, also, Boris, uh, who's not here with us, and Ms. Serene Saitamont, who's not here with us, and Ms. Uh, Elizabeth Lomelli, who's not here with us, uh, but they represent Eagle Rock um, and Koreatown Pico Union. And my, my name is Alex Campbell. I'm the uh, parent educator coach for the Historic Central uh, Avenue Community Schools and for South Los Angeles uh, Community Schools. And we also have Mr. Segreto here today, who uh, had our wonderful presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And I'd like to let families know, please reach out to us. Feel free uh, to contact us. Our emails are here on, on the screen. If you have questions, uh, you, you need support, you have a concern, please let us know. And, and I just want to add, I added both the English and Spanish versions of the safety plan for secondary schools, so middle school and high school students as well as there. Thank you, Mr. Segredo. And uh, so please check the links in the chat for those safety plans. And we appreciate uh, your attendance with our workshop today. And um, I also would like to uh, thank, and I'm sorry, uh, I'd like to thank uh, um, behind the scenes uh, people that I have working with us today. We had uh, uh, Kimberly uh, and uh, uh, Elby who were be behind the scenes working with us. Uh, thank you very much, ladies. No problem. Gracias por la orientación que nos acaban de dar. Le habla Teodoro Espinosa, President. Thank you for the worship and I'm preparing for Ilac and Melo Elementary School. Thank you uh, for coming. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, muy bonita orientación, porque tenemos niños pequeños los cuales cuidar mucho todavía y les agradecemos estos momentos que nos dedican para orientarlos y poder uh, 